All right, we are now looking at the some of the details of the life of John the Twenty Third, written by a, a, a apostate Jesuit priest. Apostate uh, meaning uh, he may have retained the name Catholic, but apostate in the sense, well, he went along with Vatican II, of course. Uh, not only went along with it, but as we saw, was one of thousands of priests who apostatized from the priesthood because of Vatican II in the immediate wake of Vatican II. I know of at least one case of someone who was turned away uh, twice uh, from embracing the faith, from entering the church, because in two different cases and two instances of two different priests who had been assigned to teach him the faith, uh, both of those priests apostatized. So this person was so badly scandalized by that that he ended up never, in fact, becoming a Catholic, even though on two different occasions he had agreed to become a Catholic. He never actually did, being so scandalized by that. So all thanks to Vatican II, meaning thanks to John XXIII, who was, in fact, it must be laid at his feet, set up by Pius XII. It's definitely set up by him. So... On the top of page 48, we went over some of this yesterday, but I hadn't sent out the notes. This author has certain ideas and does not hide them. Remember that he refers to St. Pius X only as Pius X. As uh, modernists always hated St. Pius X. Including, uh, clearly, Ron Colley himself had no love for St. Pius X. Saying, he's no saint, remember. After, after this is when he's supposedly himself Pope after Pius XII had canonized St. Pius X. So on the one hand, you see that really a disconnect to a great extent in Pius XII, you know, under whose, the title of whose reign we're, we're looking at all of this here. That he was definitely no modernist himself. That he was very much in favor of the measures taken against modernists. We saw that some time ago. But at the same time, himself as Pope, definitely did not censor the people who needed to be censored, not with the degree of severity that they merited, and even set up certain people who would, ended up, who would end up being prime movers of Vatican II. Prime movers getting the council started and then promulgating it. In, 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 more than, in every way, people who, who brought it into being and then to fruition were set up during the reign of Pius XII. So, uh, the, remember we said that the so-called Patriarch of Constantinople, Athenagoras, compared John the Twenty-Third to John the Baptist, the precursor. And if uh, and this is John the Twenty-Third serving as the quote-unquote Pope of Transition, uh, not only because he was in for only a brief time, but also because he prepared the passage of Catholics to a new Teardian religion for whom the Messiah would be his intimate friend Montini. So, uh, you know, this, this is, this is a, a, a quotation here, which is why I have the spelling Messiah. Usually Catholics spell that to Messiahs. That's really just a, a side point. Uh, so this is, uh, uh, this section here, these next couple of pages in the notes are largely taken from uh, either this biography of John the Twenty-Third, or other sources quoted by Father Ricosa in the articles, that a series of articles that he wrote on John the Twenty-Third, which actually serve our purpose quite nicely here for studying uh, Ron Colley's career during the reign of Pius XII, uh, because he goes right up to, right up into Vatican II, as I recall, from, from when we had those, uh, when I read a table a couple of years ago, uh, that he goes right up to that point, uh, to just a few years after the death of Pius XII. So this is, this right here, this quotation, these, the, uh, the, the part that begins with dates, anniversaries, birthdays were important to him. This is a quotation from that biography. And so, again, this author here betraying himself as a modernist right away, John entered salvation history in 1881. <laughs> modernists love to use that. And history, that's, that's one of their, that's a code where history is a, by that, they mean not simply looking at historical facts, as what we're doing here. We're just looking at what happened in the past and uh, gaining a correct understanding of things through that. This is largely, remember, a, an apologetics course in many ways. Not in the way that the De Revelazione course is an apologetics course, but uh, in the sense that we're studying the history of the church in order to, uh, to a great extent, uh, defend the church from all kinds of false accusations. 
leveled against her. Or, uh, and that could be quite tricky sometimes because every plausible accusation has some element of truth to it. There, there's, um, yeah, but either it's only partially true or it's, uh, what is, is stated is a, is, a, is a misrepresentation of something that is true. So that uh, it's, a st it's an accusation uh, that, uh, the, who's, say, who's a, uh, the, the, the thing being asserted, in which the thing being asserted appears to be true but is not actually. So in order to answer all of that, we have to, to find out what is actually the case in, in, many, in, many, uh, in, in many famous instances that come up constantly. In our case here, we're looking at uh, really how Vatican II happened. Uh, how, how did this happen? So shortly after the reign of uh, uh, Pius the Twelfth. So uh, in, in a way, this is uh, this enters into it, and and will uh, it'll enter into apologetics as well for for certain things that we ourselves do all the time. But that's that's a bit uh, down the road. Uh, history is, in, as as when modernists talk about studying history and how important it is, uh, they're not talking about that. They're not talking about just determining the facts of, a, of, a, of, necess, of, the, of a, a thorough scholarly effort to be made in determining things that have actually happened. What they mean by studying history is historicizing, which means finding some, making up some excuse to disregard every single truth of the faith uh, by saying that, oh, that, was, uh, the, the, that, that teaching was just a product of its time. When they're talking about history, they're, they really mean historicizing. Explaining things away as just being products of their time. Of course, the, the supreme irony of all of that is the fact that there is absolutely nothing that is more a product of its time than Vatican II itself. And there is nothing that, just like every other fad from the 1960s, it's dying out rapidly. And is only popular with, with, with those who embraced it enthusiastically at the time. So that is the ultimate irony of it all, and uh, that's one of the reasons why they hate, just absolutely hate, any vestige at all of the Catholic faith. I mean, Bergoglio obviously has an obsession with that, attacking traditionalists all the time. Because consider the, the tiny, tiny percentage of people in the Novus Ordo who have any attachment to traditional externals at all. Of course, in the Novus Ordo, that's all they're getting is the externals. <clears throat> it's devoid of substance. Those, those masses are... All are almost all invalid. There are very few, of course, validly ordained priests left in the Novus Ordo these days. Very few, therefore, valid masses. But what they really hate is any, any at all, any manifestation of any vestige of the of, of attachment to the the Catholic faith, and among their people. They absolutely there is no manifestation of that too small to merit hatred, and the swiftest punishment. Uh, you know, Father De Say, for example, when he left the uh, Novus Ordo, left his diocese, uh, he was very shortly thereafter, quote unquote, excommunicated after his bishop consulted, his Novus Ordo bishop consulted uh, Rome on what to do about this. So, no accompaniment, no compassion, uh, no pastoral solution there, no excommunication. That's it. You're done. You defy the model. That's the one thing they can't take, is any, as, as being suspect of Catholicism. Just as among Catholics, you, you might say something, oh, that's suspect of heresy. No, in the Novus Ordo, you're suspect of Catholicism. Suspect of maybe having the Catholic faith. Not good. And, you know, looked upon with suspicion and disdain, at the very least, if not yeah, ousted entirely. So, salvation history of this author, obviously, is a modernist. Well, he does actually give many, uh, his, his, that is to say, uh, this is not to say that his own research is to be dismissed because of that. He obviously did his research. It can be corroborated from other sources as well. Uh, so he's not historicizing anything away here because he has no motive to. Yeah, he, what, it's in his interest uh, to uh, present the facts accurately, in fact, because in his mind, it makes John the 23rd look really great. Whereas in reality, to anybody who actually understands things, anybody with the virtue of faith, in fact, understands that this is all horrible. But so this, this right here is an example of just a listing of facts that he gave, which is actually very interesting. Also born that year were four boys whose lives were to intersect with his own, 
Pierre Thierry de Chardin, a, uh, uh, he says here, Jesuit, paleontologist, mystic, he should add to that list, pantheist. Uh, you, you, if you haven't seen him yet, I, I suppose you will in the, in the Modern Errors course, in the uh, New Theology course. I say the chorus on all the, taking down all the people who uh, invented and, and foisted the New Theology on, on the, or attempted to, have foisted on the church. Ernesto Bonaiuti, his fellow seminarian who was driven out of the church as a modernist, remember, excommunicated by Benedict XV for denying the real presence. And to get excommunicated by Benedict XV, you really had to have messed up. Uh, remember, he was the one who shut down the Sodalitium Pianum. He was excommunicated by Benedict XV. Uh, Alcide de Gasperi, who spent the Second World War in the Vatican Library and emerged to lead the Christian Democrats, so a leftist. And Augustin Bea, another Jesuit, who became the founder president of the Secretariat for Christian Unity, and also who produced the translation of the Psalter, who was commissioned to do that job by Pius XII. So he says, Angelo Roncalli came last in this vintage year. Yes, vintage vinegar. It's not, it's not fine wine we're talking about in this case, that's for sure. So Father Ricosa states, uh, says on this, it was certainly not Roncalli's fault that he was the contemporary of these four personages. Obviously, nobody blames anyone else for being born the same year as, as anyone else. Uh, but we shall see that the author of the biography of John XXIII doesn't link their destinies by accident. Indeed, they all ultimately pursued the same agenda. So you have the uh, Théâtre de Chardin, uh, who was not excommunicated by Pius XII, even though he ought to have been, obviously, reduced to the lay state. The full severity of every penalty possible against him should have been leveled. In fact, they were not. Uh, Buena uh, we've seen him. Also, the uh, political leftist, and then Bea as well. And all of them pursuing the same agenda. You'll see that, too, if you haven't in the new theology course, the, the, moral, uh, the, the course taking down those new theologians, the modern errors course, that all of those leftists, all of those new theologians, all welcomed uh, the, the victory of Soviet Russia in the Second World War. That was something they were all very happy about because they were the ecclesiastical leftists and they were very happy to see the, the, what everybody recognized as being the worst form of political leftism emerge victorious. They were very happy to see that. Uh, so it was also, uh, they were all, most of them were censored to a degree, not, not to the extent they ought to have been, but to some degree uh, during the reign of Pius XII. But then they all seemed to have a, something of a resurgence after World War II. And that was uh, something that uh, was not by accident. You know, they, they, in other words, they, they had a morale boost with that. So going back to Roncalli here, at any rate, the family did not form the young Roncalli for very long. Uh, in 1892, at 11 years of age, he entered the minor seminary at Bergamo and continued his seminary training at Bergamo until 1901, the date when the local bishop, Guindani, sent him to complete his ecclesiastical studies in Rome. So the, thing, the first conclusion here is that when someone starts pursuing the priesthood at 11 years of age, entering the minor seminary. Uh, of course, that's, uh, that's, that's long before he started studying philosophy or theology, but uh, the, even just entering even a minor seminary at that point, rather than just a, a regular school, even a regular Catholic school, uh, indicates a, already an interest in the priesthood, already an interest in the priesthood, if nothing else. Uh, it's true that not everyone who graduated from a minor seminary went on to then pursue the priesthood in a major seminary, but it, was, it, it already indicated a certain interest, entering the minor seminary. So when someone enters a minor seminary at age 11, you must, you, your first conclusion is this must be a very pious family. This must be a very pious family to inspire an interest in the priesthood in, in an 11-year-old boy. And yes, that's true. It seems that it was a, he was just a, born into a normal, pious Italian family. But then we'll see, the local bishop, uh, Guindani, sends him to Rome to complete his ecclesiastical studies. Hence, it is especially necessary to research the first influences at Bergamo that would so mark the character of Roncalli, which resulted in so many contrasts with his, as we've seen, pious Catholic family. 
And the most reverend Camilo Guindani, Bishop of Bergamo, was a leader in social action and was the former pupil and friend of the Bishop of Cremona, Jeremias Bonomelli, the stormy petrel, as they, that's, that's, a, that's a type of bird that the author of this biography calls him, of the Italian episcopacy. One of his pamphlets, one of Bonomelli's pamphlets, Italy and the Reality of Things, had been placed on the Index of Forbidden Books in 1889. And that means by Leo XIII. It was a plea for reconciliation between the papacy and the new Italian state. Remember, Leo XIII was very interested, as, as, as uh, accommodating as he was in many ways, Leo XIII uh, was, did not compromise at all on the Roman question, as it was called, which, as we've seen, was the question of who actually owns the papal states. Is it this new Italian regime? Or is it the Holy See which has always owned them, or for many centuries has owned them? And uh, it, was, it was actually in order to resolve the Roman question that Pope Leo XIII instituted the Leonine prayers. So that's why they're called the Leonine prayers after low mass, because they were instituted by Pope Leo XIII. And it was for that purpose. So he wanted every priest to pray after every low mass for the resolution of the Roman question. Uh, that was, of course, resolved during the reign of Pius XI, but actually Pius XI said that the, keep, keep, keep saying those prayers after low mass. So uh, Leo XIII, uh, uh, as, as much as he was accommodating in many ways, was never accommodating on that point, and in fact, uh, the friction with the Italian government over that point uh, got, reached such a pitch that at one point he threatened to leave Italy, which would have been a disaster. <laughs> for the Italian regime. Remember, we've seen how much the, uh, the, the, uh, Italy needs the papacy in order, to, uh, in, or, in order not to be a third world country, in effect. <laughs> that uh, were it not for that, it would, uh, it, the country would uh, not have the industry of tourism that it does. It would not have that, which is definitely the number one industry in Italy. So, uh, he goes to uh, uh, he uh, see, the 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 Roman question was had not yet been resolved. Of course, uh, if this point we're talking about here, uh, Roncalli going to Rome to study the Roman question still not resolved would not be resolved till the Lateran Accords in 1929. But this uh, as early as 1889, uh, Bishop Bonomelli have uh, had his his pamphlet on on the point put on the index. Uh, holding that the Pope should cease sighing for the ancien régime, for the, for the old rule, for the old way of things, the old arrangement. Uh, uh, that the Pope should accept the loss of the Papal States as a liberation for the Church and permit Catholics to take their place in Italian political life. So he was of that school. And here we see the, you might think, well, was not the Pacelli family of a similar disposition? Do they not have a similar idea that the church should just come to terms with the way things are? And the answer to that is, yes, they did. Well, not, not Marco Antonio Pacelli, of course, but Filippo, uh, Francesco, Eugenio, all of them, they, they did reach that conclusion. In fact, were uh, well, Francesco very, very actively involved with Eugenio's support in negotiating the Lateran Accords, which effected just that, a reconciliation in some sense, between the, uh, uh, the Italian state and the Holy See, at least settling that question, it was not the end of friction by any means between Pius XI and Mussolini, but it was the official uh, solution of the Roman question. But it was, the Pacellis never thought this was a good thing, that the Papal States had just been taken over. They never saw it as a liberation for the church. Definitely not that. Not even the most conciliatory of the Pacellis would have ever said that. So here we're, on, we're talking about the condemnation of the ideas that this is a good, positively good thing for the church. Remember, that's what the revolutionaries themselves who seized it said, that we're, do, we're doing a favor for the church here in, in stealing the church's property, which is so utterly nonsensical and scarcely deserves comment. Uh, but that was exactly what they were saying. So, in other words, this is a pamphlet that puts forward the, the very same nonsense 
uh, that the revolutionaries who seized the papal states put forward. So they should uh, accept the loss of the papal states as a liberation for the church, the pope should, so these conciliarists said, and permit Catholics to take their place in Italian political life. Remember that um, the, the rule had, had always been uh, non expedit or even non licet for, uh, no, that is to say, Catholics are either, it's either not expedient or not permitted at all. Remember, Pius IX put down a non expedit, it is not expedient. Leo XIII stiffened that and made that non licet, it is not licit. Don't get involved in any way in the, uh, the, the operations of, the, of this new Italian regime, uh, uh, not even by way of voting. Don't even engage in voting uh, in this government. Uh, this, that, that was talking about the, the overarching national government. Local elections were another story. But that was, uh, that was always the position. And so in, 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 the, in the 1880s, when that was published, that was contrary to Leo XIII's uh, non licet. It is not licit. You can see very easily why this got put on the index. In the first decades of the 1900s, when under Pius X, the political anti-religious struggle assumed some dangerous aspects, but Amelie even believed it, it uh, a duty to propose the separation of church and state, which is condemned. <laughs> is an idea repeatedly condemned by popes. The idea that church and state ought to be separated. Whatever Parachitan's accidental good effects there might be in some places because of it, that is a disordered situation. During the modernist crisis, the prelate declared, in my seminary there is not a shadow of modernism, but there is much modernity. And there's probably no more effective way of pleading guilty to being a modernist than to say that. Because the modernists themselves never applied the term modernist to themselves. They always denied that they were modernists. They always said, well, it has absolutely everything, same Pius X. Oh, yes, that, that's all terrible and, and evil and condemned, absolutely. But that's not what we say. Meanwhile, it was exactly what they were saying. But they denied it. Yeah, they're just like the Jansenists, you may know that. You may, I mentioned it before, we studied that some years ago, uh, that the Jansenists, uh, it, it, I'll put it this way, that the Jansenists are always the first ones who come up when talking about what are known as dogmatic facts. That is to say, uh, not actual dogmatic definitions of the church, but certain facts which are so closely connected with dogmatic definitions that to deny those facts is... You're, you're, if you're not also thereby denying a dogma as well, you are definitely and unavoidably committed to it. And so the Jansenists, in other words, they said, uh, uh, yes, absolutely everything that the popes have condemned and what they call Jansenism is, is bad. That's all condemned. But that's not what we say. And in our books, those, those teachings are not to be found. So whereas, in fact, it is a, dog, it is a dogmatic fact that one of the things that fall under the heading of dogmatic facts are uh, statements in which the church says that this, these errors are condemned and they are to be found in these documents, in these books, or whatever it might be, or whatever way they're presented. That these things are false and condemned, and this is where you can find them. That if you, uh, if you, if you, if you deny that those can be found there, you're well on your way to denying the church's teachings on what actually is the nature of the situation here. And so the modernists said that of themselves. They really, yeah, the modernists were just, uh, well, were very closely imitating the Jansenists in this way, that they denied, they said that uh, the modernism of St. Pius X, or the pa Pius X, they wouldn't have called him St. Pius X, but the modernism of Pius X is not the modernism of the modernists. In other words, what St. Pius X condemned, we don't say. We don't say that. Yeah, it's exactly what they said. Exactly. It destroyed them. The only thing they had left to say was, that's not what we say. That was, that, was, that was as far as it could go. So he is saying essentially the same thing here. Oh, it's, it's, we're, we're, in other words, modernity, where we're very much, uh, uh, we're very, very much up to date here. But we're not modernists. No, don't, don't look here for modernism. I mean, that's almost like saying, uh, I've never murdered anybody, so don't accuse me of being a murderer. Okay, I didn't say so. 
but now, obviously, if he's denying this, uh, it's, it's because you, that he was under suspicion of it. And uh, definitely, no, there was modernism in the, in the Bergamo Seminary. There's absolutely no question of that, and we'll see that. So is it necessary to believe that Bishop, uh, is it necessary to believe Bishop Bonomelli when he excludes all traces of modernism from his seminary? This is a question put forward by Father Ricosa. One may certainly doubt it when, uh, when, uh, when one knows that Bonomelli was an intimate friend of uh, Fogazzaro, the novelist of modernism, who kept him company on the index of prohibited books. So he's on the, he's on the forbidden books club. Oh, sorry, Bonomelli, uh, his, his seminary was that of Cremona, the Bishop of Cremona, not, uh, not Bergamo. His friend Guindani, the Bishop of Bergamo, uh, one of whose successors, Rodini Tedeschi, was someone with whom Roncalli was very, collaborated very closely as a young priest. So Bishop Bonomelli and Bishop Guindani, both of their seminaries falling under suspect of modernism. So likewise, in Bonomelli's moral theology, there is something laughable the older I get, the more I am, I am convinced that theologians have enormously increased mortal sins, as if hell, with an eternity of pain, were a mere nothing. Human law, which would condemn a man to death for a grave injury done to a fellow man, would be horrifying, but is not the teaching of these theologians equally horrifying, who, for a youthful transgression, for a holy day mass not heard, etc., etc., would condemn a Christian to hell. Certainly these are sins, but one wonders if there is a proportion between these sins and the dreadful pains of hell. You could not make that up, except, that, except for him. Well, unless you're a modernist like this, you couldn't make that up. Uh, I mean, he's, there's so many problems with what he just said. Uh, for one thing, uh, laws of capital punishment are in themselves legitimate. The state has the right to put someone to death when, they're, when, when the situation warrants it. It has to be done with public authority. No one may take the law into his own hands. But that is legitimate, and in some cases, it would even be a grave injustice on the part of the state not to inflict capital punishment. In some cases, certainly. Of course, uh, to, in, in some cases, when it's very clearly deserved and is not inflicted, <coughs> And in fact, actually invites further crimes. Say, for example, in the case of somebody who has clearly guilt is clearly guilty of murder, and the state, for whatever reason, is just not not inflicting the the clearly proportionate punishment on this uh, unrepentant murderer. When that, when you have such a case as that, that actually encourages further murders because those who uh, say had some family member killed by this by by, by some hardened killer. And when, they're, when they see that justice is not being done, they'll be very much inclined to take the law into their own hands and kill that murderer, which is another cr sin of murder. So it actually, f failure to inflict, uh, to inflict necessary justice when, 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 when severity is the fact the thing that is required inv invites further crimes, in fact. So uh, uh, human laws, it is, it is a horrifying thing, obviously, that it should be necessary in any case for the, for the common good. It's always with that end in mind, for the common good. It is horrifying that uh, it should ever be necessary to, to put a man to death, that the common good should require that. But if it, the common good does indeed require it, it is uh, not horrifying that the common good be preserved. And that's true, that in the execution of a criminal, nobody's happy that a man is being put to death. That is, not the, that is not the thing to rejoice over, as much as there is anything to rejoice over. The, the thing to be happy about is the fact that justice is being served and that the common good thereby is also being served. That is the reason why that is legitimate for the state to inflict that, and sometimes even necessary. The common good sometimes really uh, requires that on occasion. There are many cases in which the, the, the state might be entitled to it, but might exercise clemency uh, when it is listed to do so. Certainly that is true. But in itself, it's, uh, to, to say this, the obvious conclusion from what he's saying here is that that's, uh, that's an evil thing in itself, that uh, there should be laws of capital punishment. 
which is that, that, that very much, he would be very, uh, he would be very, very comfortable in the Nova Sordo today. Definitely he would be. And also they're talking about, uh, he says, who for youthful transgression uh, would condemn a Christian to hell? The obvious conclusion there is sins of impurity, which are very common among the young. Now, all, the, all the moral theologians do talk about that. But they also are unanimous, certainly all the Catholics are, anybody with any kind of reputation as a Catholic moral theologian, they're all unanimous in talking about just how grave those sins are. And there's no question about that at all. There, it's definitely not disproportionate. The punishments of, of hell for eternity are not disproportionate for someone who should die guilty of, of sins of that nature. That, that's absurd. As Father Ricosa puts it, absolutely laughable. So this is, uh, yeah, he'll be very, very comfortable saying these things in the Novus Ordo today. Uh, yes, in theory, yeah, that's bad, but no, pastoral solution, so it's okay. Thus was Bishop Bonamelli, Bishop of Cremona, author of anonymous tracts against the teachings of the church, friend of modernists, prompt to retract his words, but not with sincerity, hostile to the moral teachings of the church, and not only of the theologians, which horrified him. Because this is not, it's true, all of those, these teachings, these things he's just dismissing, ah, that's, uh, why worry too much about that? Theologians are just getting all worked up about it. Uh, to, to, to dismiss the teachings of moral theologians like that is, is serious enough. But it's not just the teachings of moral theologians where you find these things. There are many pronouncements of the church on, a certain, on, on, on some of these things. Uh, for, I mean, it was not until the reign of Pius XI that there was a, a solemn condemnation of artificial birth control. But it was always considered gravely sinful because the reasoning for that is so obvious. That is so obviously contrary to the natural law that there's no way it could be anything but gravely sinful. Uh, and, uh, uh, and also I say talking here about holy days on the mass, not, uh, or for missing mass, is that really on a holy day of obligation? Is that really a mortal sin? Uh, by law of the church, very clearly, yes, it is. Uh, that's it. So this is, he's, not, he's, he's also dismissing the, the, the magisterium of the church here and the, the, uh, the authority of the church in passing disciplinary laws. So uh, how he survived is, is, is incredible, really. But again, modernists, they, some of them were slippery. Some were caught and punished, as they ought to have been, but others, some were slippery. And uh, we'll see, Roncalli was one of the slippery ones. We'll just see how how shamefully deceitful he could be when it served his purposes. So Bishop Guindani was his friend and student, was the friend and student of Bonomelli, and the young seminarian Roncalli was sent by Bishop Guindani to Rome to pursue his studies and thus to reach higher levels. So Roncalli arrived at Rome at the age of 20, at the end of the reign of Leo XIII, studied at the Apollinare, and was ordained to the priesthood at the beginning of St. Pius X's reign. Over these three and a half years, a part was set aside for military service. So that's something that was common in the past. You can even hear stories about that uh, of seminarians, uh, even at Icon in the 70s, uh, would have to leave the seminary for a year or two. They'd, they'd show up, begin their training, and then have to leave for a year or two to do mandatory service in the French army. Uh, Father Guipin, for example, became a paratrooper. <laughs> So that, 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 was a, that was a fairly common thing, that even the clergy should be roped into that sometimes, which was not ideal. Definitely the church always protested against that, but sometimes it, the situation was just such that the, the church could not gain concessions from, from the state on that point. And it's a bit, it's been true for a long time. There, there, were, there were problems of that nature in France during the Napoleonic Wars. So Napoleon wanted to conscript the clergy into his armies. The church protested against it, of course. And at one point, uh, Napoleon's uncle was actually the uh, Cardinal Archbishop of Paris, and who at uh, one point, Napoleon finally got the consent from Napoleon, okay, I won't conscript priests into the army. Uh, but he said, I would conscript seminarians. So what uh, uh, the solution, uh, this is the story told by Bishop Dolan, I have to find a citation for it myself, but uh, what, uh, uh, according to that story he told, that he, there, therefore, this cardinal just ordained all of the seminarians in the major seminary to the priesthood. Just right away. Okay, now we're all priests. 
They can't be conscripted into the army. They had to continue their training, uh, but they were priests, and therefore they would not be conscripted into the army. Uh, not, uh, not, that's not to be recommended. <laughs> that is not a great way of do dealing with it, but uh, he was desperate, and that's what he did. So, uh, one of Roncalli's professors was actually Monsignor uh, Umberto Benigni, who, during the reign of St. Pius X, would become the founder of the Sodalitium Pianum and the most decided adversary of the modernists. That being said, disquieting individuals were not lacking among his, that is, Roncalli's seminary confers. Buonaiuti, eventually excommunicated, Rossi, who would fall to Protestantism, and Turkey, Buonaiuti's collaborator. So he's just in with the worst bunch from the start, practically. In a way, of course, he's a, uh, Roncalli might, look, might be looked upon as something of a victim, but he certainly became a, a perpetrator himself, and there's no question of that. He was thoroughly corrupted by this. So what was the relationship between Angelo Roncalli and Ernesto Bonaiuti? Uh, Bonaiuti, who would later be excommunicated as a modernist you know, by Benedict XV. A new, this is a you know, quotation from our biography, mm -hmm. or the biography, we'll call it our, bi our biography, but uh, uh, this is a quotation, a new generation of Catholic intellectuals was in gestation, so in, in training, in development, in, in the seminaries at this time. At the Roman seminary, the most brilliant, and this author again, his, his, his sympathies come to light again, uh, the most brilliant was Ernesto Bonaiuti. Chance united them during Angelo's first semester from January until July 1901. It was the custom to draw lots for places in the chapel or the refectory, as well as for walking companions. Bonaiuti drew Roncalli. Hence, they often walked together across Rome. After his election, Roncalli happened to admit that he had learned much fr from Don Ernesto. So that's uh, that's one thing to keep in mind, I suppose. That uh, this is it. Uh, John Twenty Third didn't uh, call him by his first name, Don Ernesto, because uh, he's called Vatican II. Uh, it, even long before the Novus Ordo came into being, it was it was customary uh, in in in, I mean, in Italy to refer to to, to use the, the title Don and then the, the priest's first name. It's not like saying Father Bob or anything like that. Uh, that's just normal. So it's uh, in itself the use of that title is not telling. But what he says is that uh, he admits that he had learned much from Don Ernesto. That is telling. So confiding in his memories, however, of, of 1901 to 1904, he claims to have never discussed with him theological, biblical, or historical questions, and to never have read any of his works which circulated underground. Now that is surprisingly specific for something he didn't do. <laughs> I never talked about any of these things with him, I'm listing all of them. <laughs> a little hard to believe. I never read any of these books. I know it's exactly books I didn't read. <laughs> yeah, a little hard to believe. So one wonders what they could have talked about during their walks. It's hard to imagine that Buonaiuti did not bring up the questions which preoccupied him. And this is an interesting note by Father Ricosa. Clearly, the author of the most prominent biography of John XXIII does not believe much in Roncalli's sincerity in regard to the supposed innocence of his relationship with Buonaiuti. So the author himself, of, uh, who like, clearly likes Roncalli, he clearly likes John the Twenty Third. Uh, just the very title of the biography, at least uh, some of it, uh, the title given in at least some editions, indicates that just all on its own. Uh, he doesn't believe these claims of Roncalli. That uh, there was no influence. That there, there was nothing that made him into uh, the the uh, the, um, the one who started Vatican II. There, that that uh, Buonaiuti had no, had nothing to do with that. He doesn't believe that himself. So we shall see other cases where the memory of Roncalli was conveniently faulty. Yes, on more than one occasion, which just is, means to say that he he had no problem lying when it served his purpose. Roncalli. And that's how he avoided getting into any worse trouble than he was already in during the reign of St. Pius X. And we'll see that, too. So on August 10th, 1904, 
Bishop Apotelli ordained Don Angelo Roncalli, a priest in the Church of Santa Maria in Monte Santo. Those acquainted with the ordination ceremony know that each new ordinand chooses a priest, called a priest assistant, to assist him during the sacred function. He is something of a sponsor and is normally a friend of the ordinand. So it's, uh, if you've ever seen an ordination ceremony, you know that each new priest has, uh, well, ideally each new priest has a priest who uh, one, let's say one, there is one assistant priest for each new priest, newly ordained priest, who himself wears uh, a chasuble on, uh, over a surplice, but he himself is wearing uh, priestly vestments as he kneels next to the newly ordained priests who are concelebrating, in fact, the mass with the ordaining bishop. It's one of very few instances in the Roman Rite uh, in which concelebration is actually permitted and, in fact, required. Uh, it's, uh, the, the Novus Ordo does it all the time, but traditionally it was done very seldom. Uh, well, no, no more frequently anyway than ordinations, priestly ordinations and Episcopal consecrations. And concelebration, by the way, means that they are all, that the, the ordaining bishop as well as all of the newly ordained priests are all offering the Mass together. Now, when the, the newly ordained priests, of course, say all of the words, starting with the offertory, they recite all of the prayers with the bishop, that they are including the words of consecration. They say it with the intention of consecrating, and that their words indeed have that effect together. The, the bishop, of course, is the one who's actually holding the sacred host and, and the sacred chalice at those moments, but all of them are truly consecrating together at the celebration of the ordination mass. And uh, what we just had an Episcopal consecration last year, but anyone who was there for that remembers that it, from the case of an Episcopal consecration, it's even more striking that the new bishop is actually at the altar, is at the side of the altar reciting the prayers of the Mass from a se separate missal at the side of the altar, and himself actually receives half of the large host uh, which the consecrating bishop held, held in his hands at the consecration of the Mass and elevated at the elevation. Whereas the newly ordained priests re receive Holy Communion before the recitation of the, or before the deacon sings the confitior, because that is part of the celebrant's communion, uh, which is separated from the communion of anyone else who might receive Holy Communion at that Mass by the confitior, which begins the, really what is a separate ceremony of distribution of Holy Communion inserted into the Mass. Uh, they, the newly ordained priests will receive small hosts, just as the faithful do. Uh, but uh, a newly consecrated bishop receives actually half of the uh, host that was uh, consecrated uh, or held in the hands of the consecrating bishop at the when he actually pronounced the words of consecration. So uh, this is, in other words, it's the very uh, we usually refer to the first mass of a newly ordained priest as the first one, first mass that he says himself as the only celebrant. Uh, in a way, the ordination mass is the first mass of the newly ordained priest. Uh, and uh, so choosing an assistant priest for that is uh, uh, this, that, that says something about the friendship of the, of the new priest to the priest whom he has invited to be his assistant. That's usually one, one thing that, uh, that newly ordained priests are allowed to choose for themselves is who will be their assistant priest. Uh, and they, they also usually get to choose who is their assistant priest for their first masses. They say first masses, which they uh, say as the, as the only celebrant. The idea in that case being still that you just have a new ordained priest here. He hasn't actually, this is the first time saying mass. He needs somebody to make sure he doesn't mess up. <laughs> that is, uh, it, adds, it, adds, it adds to the solemnity of the occasion, certainly, but there is, uh, it originated with that practical concern that, uh, it was the first time for doing everything, and sometimes people doing things for the first time make mistakes. So have another priest there to make sure that no serious mistakes are made. So that's a, it's a, of course, ordination ceremony itself is a tremendous moment in the life of any priest. That is the, that is the, uh, the, the, the ceremony in which he is made a priest forever. That is something he'll remember, of course, for his entire life and the, all the circumstances of it. And uh, certainly whom he chose to be his assistant priest. So, when the vice rector declined the invitation to be Roncalli's assistant priest at the ordination ceremony, it was Ernesto Bonaiuti who assisted Don Nicolas Turki as well as Don Angelo during the ordination ceremony. And so, the last thing we have in our notes for today is the question, could that have been by accident? We'll see. <laughs>